So I did like a trail marathon. And then next thing I know, I'm like doing a 50K and a 50 miler. And then I did a hundred miler. And then I did 200 milers. Wait, hold on, hold on. And it's really. Let's back up. Let's back up. <laughs> you ran for 200 miles? 100 miles. I've done that twice. Welcome Mindy Slovinsky to the podcast today. Mindy lives in Maine. She is one of Nick Delgadillo's online coaching clients. I don't know a ton about her, but we're going to find out today. So Mindy, why don't you start us off with uh, how strong you are? What, what are your PRs? Wow. Okay. Um, I should, I should say first how short I am. So people don't think so these first. numbers sound better. Yeah. <laughs> first. So I'm like barely five feet tall. Um, so let's see, my press is 102. My, um, my bench is 130. My squat is about 203. And I think my deadlift is about 236. That's pretty cool. So where did you start? Oh gosh, like nothing. Yeah. So for example, what was your, what was your squat on day one? Do you remember? Oh my gosh. The bar plus you know, 10 pounds or something. I mean, it was like, it was, it was really starting from, I totally starting from scratch. Yeah. I had not lifted before. And how long yeah. ago was this? This was four, about four years ago. So summer of 2018, I started lifting. What's your, um, uh, what's your body weight, by the way, in your age? I am 51. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably around like 116. So 51 um, years old, 116 pounds body weight, squatting and deadlifting over 200. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That, that, I, I'm glad that you're saying that because I have no point of reference. You know, that was, it, it was a little bit of isolation, you know, kind of like doing this by yourself. So it's like, if Nick's like, man, you're getting strong. It's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're getting Sounds strong. Great. You 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 earn your sticker when you're strong uh, as a woman when you have a 315 deadlift, a 225 squat, a 150 bench and a 100 pound press. Um but keep in mind that the variation um from woman to woman is much bigger than it is from man to man. Yeah. So it's it's a lot harder to to develop a strength standard for women just because you're four foot 11, you know, and some women are six yeah. foot two. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you're, you're strong no, as hell. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you should know by the way, that, um, my wife is five foot three and she weighs, well, she, she's breastfeeding at the moment. So she weighs in the one forty. She norm normally weighs, you know, high one twenties, low one thirties. Mm -hmm. She deadlifts roughly, she deadlifts a bit less than you and squats around the same as you do. And um, mm -hmm. we were messing around yesterday and, and practicing some jujitsu because she's kind of feeling good after nice. birth now. And um, she's strong as hell. I, I told her, I said, uh, I said, I, I roll with the white belts, like the, the male white belts. And you're stronger yeah. than basically every white belt that's under 170, 160 pounds, including the guys, wow. you know. Um, mm -hmm. like there's a, there's a pretty nasty blue belt. Who's, who's a 16 year old, um, in class. And mm -hmm. she's, she's definitely stronger than he is. And she's like, Oh really? I was like, it's yeah, awesome. you can tell. So you, you are, you are quite <laughs> strong and maybe you should, maybe you should go down to Iowa park and meet your coach, Nick, and go to his new jujitsu school and, and, uh, and see for yourself. That would be amazing. <laughs> oh, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. You yeah. know, I really don't have a chance to sort of test out strength other than, the barbell so it's kind of cool thinking about it in different contexts you yeah. know yeah well um no one's challenging me to like a no one's challenging me to arm wrestle at the grocery store unfortunately that's, a, that's the unfortunate part of <laughs> I, mean, the, I don't know why yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> um all right well so tell me tell me what motivated you to do all this because it's fairly unusual um for a 51 year old woman to start 
strength training in this manner and to, you know, be able to lift totally. over 200 pounds. So what, what was it that, that got you into this whole thing? Yeah. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a recovering ultra runner. Ah. So, um, th that was sort of my, I wouldn't say my window in, but it's sort of like kind of the path that I took. Um, I was never, a, a, as a kid, I was not athletic at all. Like I was the kid, like on the swim team that they were like politely clapping for, like a, as I came in, like I was finishing like half the lap as everyone else had already been done for a while. The participation trophy. So I played right field. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so not very athletic. And in high school, I mean, I'll kind of skip ahead, but like uh, started running, you know, recreationally. And um, over the years felt, you know, I was in some, you know, running groups and, and I just kind of kept pushing the distance a little bit more because, you know, once you're sort of in this group of people doing stuff, it kind of inspires you to kind of push yourself more and the social aspect was awesome. Um, and so I started running like road marathons and um, long story short, I kept hurting myself. Mm. You know, I was really, um, you know, I was getting stress fractures. I was eating like shit. I was, um, I didn't really know what I was doing. It just seemed like more was probably better. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it sort of came to, um, you know, I thought that's what health was, like kind of pushing your body really hard. Like what could be bad about that? You know, more, more, more. And um, I ended up switching over to trails, doing trail running because I was hurting myself. And it was a kinder surface. The people were a little bit more chill. Um, I like showed up at a trail race or like in my early days and like watched somebody go by, like we were sort of like where the crowd could sort of gather and this guy stopped. I watched him like stop, talk to some people, somebody handed him a beer. He like had some beer, you know, and, and then it like kind of went on his way. And I was like, what is this sport? Like, mm -hmm. these are my people. It's amazing. Just seemed a little bit more laid back. And, uh, so um, same thing kind of happened with the trails, you know, there was like this great social aspect, um, and people were like starting to do like long distance. So I did like a trail marathon. And then next thing I know, I'm like doing a 50 K and a 50 miler. And then I did a hundred miler and then I did 200 milers Wait, hold on, hold on. and it's really, let's back up. Let's back up. <laughs> you ran <for laughs> 200 miles. 100 miles. I've done that twice. Good Lord. I don't even like to drive for a hundred miles. I don't even like to ride a motor. <laughs> that is, uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it seriously, really like ri riding a motorcycle for a hundred miles is grueling and you're just sitting there. Yeah. So you, yeah. you run for, I, I've heard of this before, but I've never actually talked to someone who's actually done it. You, you right. ran for a hundred miles. A hundred miles. So I'll say that there's some, you're not running like as hard as you can for a hundred miles. You know, you're running you're probably, you know, toward the end, you're walking, you're power hiking, you're running when you can. So it's, but it's still like nonstop. Yeah. There's aid stations along the way. Um, but you've got a time span really that your most races have like a cutoff, you know, that you've got to make it in. Um, but you're running all night, you're doing everything on the run and you know, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. It, cause, like cause good, it, good it marathoners really are running marathons in, in, you know, what, five hours or something. Um, so this is like, is this like a 24 hour situation or how, do, how long does it take? Yeah. yeah. So it depends on the race. I mean, a lot of most ultras are trail runs, so they're all different. Um, then different terrain, different elevation, different, all kinds of stuff. Um, so probably the fastest people, um, running the faster courses could do a hundred miles, you know, in like 13, 14 hours, 14 hours, maybe 15. Um, now that's the, those are the people that are winning, um, mountainous courses, you know, there's, there's races, uh, mountain, you know, Colorado, the Alps, all kinds of stuff. And that may, they may have like a 48 hour cutoff. Um, and people may be doing the fastest people there may be doing it in like 20 some hours or so the one I did, the ones that I did were not super heavy terrain and I'm like a mid mid packer. 
And I think it took me about 28 hours to do roughly to each of those times, like 28 or, or so. And how long was so the longest up, rest in that 28 hours? Um, hmm. The first one, I don't know, it could be like 20, 25 minutes. Um, maybe the second one, I mean, not too long, probably less than less than 15 minutes, less than 20 minutes. You kind of come in, pull into like an aid station, which is just a folding table out in the middle of the woods with people that may or may not be drunk, like handing you like grilled cheeses and, you know, filling up your water pack. You carry a, you know, carry your hydration pack and, and you get what you need, change your shoes. There's, there's places you could, it's called a drop bag. You could have like a bag of like some of your gear that they'll truck out there if you need it and like change your shirt or, or whatever. And then you just keep on going. Um, Can you tell us, tell us about, kooky. tell us about the things that go through your head and the stuff that you experience that people that haven't done it um, aren't aware of. So, yeah. so the things that strike me the most that I imagine are extremely difficult to overcome are number one, obviously just the grit required to, to do something physical for that long. Um, and then mm -hmm. I'm also curious about how your body feels during the process. And then after you do a hundred miles. Yeah. On your feet. Yeah. Um, I think about the mental part, this is really kind of a make or break for people. Um, and by profession, I'm a psychotherapist. So I think about this stuff a lot. Um, and I also raced co-race direct, um, a hundred mile race, um, up here in Maine. So I see it from the other, other side too. Um, but, uh, I, the, the training is pretty intense. Like, you know, you're running all weekend, <laughs> you know, I, I should, I, I'll caveat like a long run on the weekend and usually like a, a slightly long run the next day. So you're kind of practicing running on tired legs and stuff like that. So you kind of get to, you know, in the race, a, a lot of times you, you're meeting new people, you're running with people for a while, you know, there's sort of that, that aspect, things that just kind of keep your mind off things. Um, but when it gets dark overnight, it's like literally dark, um, it's hard. It's, um, you're, it's kind of like, just keep going, you know, and just get to the next aid station, just get, and they may be four miles apart, depending on the race, they may be seven miles apart. Um, so a lot of it for me was like, just make it to the next aid station um, and then just kind of reset and then just get to the next one. Um, I think for me, it was just like, just keep moving. If I'm walking fast, if I'm running, like, and you would be amazed. I mean, like this is coming from the person who like finished dead last in every swim race and, you know, not coordinated, all that kind of stuff. Um, You'd be amazed. It, it's very, very mental. And it's not that I have this grit that other people don't have. I think, you know, you know, it, uh, I'm just going to say like people who are hard on themselves are like, really bad place in my head. I know this place. This is, a, this is easy. I can do this. Um, there's a familiarity to it, but I think it's just like, you kind of surprise yourself. Like you, you can keep on going. Um, at, like, so I think a lot of people, really push themselves to, to do it could really have that experience of like, um, you'd be amazed at how much farther you can push yourself than you, than what seems logically possible, mm -hmm. say like a hundred miles. Mm -hmm. Um, is that what motivated um, you to do this in the first place? Seeing if I could do it. Is it, is it just, or, like just overcoming the challenge or what's the, what was the main driver for you? Yeah. Um, I think I saw people around me doing it sounded it seemed very intriguing we had friends doing it I, I have a running friend and partner and we also co-direct uh, this race and um we, there's also this thing called pacing so at some point during the race later in the race you can have what's called a pacer which is you know a person who's not running the race that is basically like there to kind of keep you keep you moving, keep you motivated, um, making sure you're okay. And she paced a friend of ours um, at a race in Vermont. And he was a little bit more toward the back of the pack. And she kind of, she saw the struggle and she was like, we can do this. She's like, I think we really need to do this. And I was like, all right, let's, let's try it. Hmm. And we did. Um, and uh, 
So it's pretty, it's, it was a lot of like, I want to see if I can do this. Like, let's just find out what happens. Good for you. Um, That's impressive. And you win a belt buckle. So I've got, <laughs> which is <laughs> you, hilarious. You, uh, but you that's win a the belt tradition. buckle and systemic inflammation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so um, tell us about that part of it. And then, and then I want you to get back to the, the story you were telling. Sure. That started that virtue. I'm just curious. About yeah. This. So, so how did your, how did your body feel after a hundred miles? It's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember back because it's been a little while, but just totally depleted. First, you're just tired. You just want to sit down, obviously, the understatement. Um, and, <laughs> and be careful when you get back up because you're pretty stiff. Yeah. Um, the recovery, there was like aches. There was like just the soreness of having, you know, done something for, you know, like a week or, or actually, you know, maybe even less than a week. And then it was just tired. Then it's just kind of like getting your stores back up. So I remember just feeling fatigued for like a couple of weeks. Um, I didn't break anything or hurt anything. You know, your feet are kind of, you know, kind of a mess after if there's like blisters or, you know, whatnot. But, um, but that's, um, I think it was more of just the fatigue and just feeling drained for a while. Um, again, and you know, people are doing this multiple times a year. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, I've had like these two little experiences, but, but they were awesome. Hell yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. More for the mental than the physical, I'm guessing. Like, I, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone believes this is good for you physically necessarily, <laughs> but it, but it certainly is, uh, it is certainly a monumental achievement to, to be able to put mind over matter for a day straight yeah. of physical activity. Yeah. Right? of just moving and just moving. And, and it's interesting because we sort of see it on the other side when we run our race, when we direct our race. Um, and we'll see people throughout the race. And it's so interesting to see who we follow, like their stories basically, because they're sort of coming in. Ours, our course is like a, an out and back for a couple of times. Mm. And so we'll see people come back in and um, there are pe people who drop, you know, the race and, and they look, okay you know like we've seen enough people by now to sort of get a sense of who could probably physically keep going but the uh, mental thing isn't there broke. um and so it's interesting watching sort of seeing who drops could be like very very fit looking people that you know um and then the people who actually finish are you know um they're they're they just they wanted it or they had something different or they were, they were just after, after something else. And they don't look like the most athletic people all the time. Like you would never guess they were an ultra runner or, um, so it's pretty cool kind of watching it sort of split out, you know, over, over the course of the race. Yeah. Cause you can be successful even without physical gifts, as long as you can, as you can, uh, yes. put your mind over the matter and, and grit, grit through it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you, you, uh, you got into running, you took it, let's just say to a bit of an extreme uh, okay. <laughs> and then what happened next? Yeah. Well, this maybe is not so surprising. Um, I really started to burn out, um, training, felt, running felt like a chore. Um, I loved the social part. I love being out in the woods, but it was like getting harder and harder to sort of get myself going. Um, and I really kind of hit a low point of just um, wrestling with like, I just don't know if I like it anymore. You know? like an and I had done all this running, you know? Yeah. yeah. Felt totally like an obligation. Um, and I was talking with a friend um, and he was like, you know, what, what would you be doing if you weren't, if you weren't running all the time? And I'm like, I don't even know. You know, like I'd done like a little bit of triathlon stuff and I didn't really like it. I'm like, I'm not going to ride my bike. I'm not going to swim. Like, what is there? I'm like, you know, I do kind of like, you know, I kind of like weightlifting, but that was like, my experience was like barbells in the gym or, you know, very minimal, but I, but I liked it. I could say like, that's a thing I could see myself landing on in the midst of like not knowing what else to do. Um, which felt kind of cute, I think was kind of monumental for me because I really had to ask myself, like, what, what do you, how do you want to move your body? You know, I felt like this sort of sense of like, I just want to slow down. I feel like I'm running literally. And I just had this sense of like, there's something about like a 
deliberate movement against resistance that I'm like, that's just all I want to do right now. Like that just feels right. Um, and so I kind of started there, you know, I sort of got this janky, like weight thing off of Craigslist, you know, it was like this, like teenager bar and like some old, like beat up York plates. Um, and I started looking online just to, to find out what was out there. And I actually ended up on, um, what I learned now was sort of like a starting strength ripoff. <laughs> and, um, yep. <laughs> and that's how, that was my window in. And what I liked about it now that I can, I can call it starting strength and appreciate it as that, but it was, um, it was simple. I wanted something simple. I mean, running in the woods sounds simple, but it's, but it had gathered so much other stuff for me that it didn't feel simple anymore. Mm-hmm. And weightlifting and this five by five program was like, this is all you need to do. You're going to do it three days a week. There's only a couple of lifts. You're not doing this circuit stuff, which I was like, I don't want to do circuit stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, there were just this, all this attention to detail about technique. And I'm like, that sounds like something I want. Um, so I started there. I had this like sheet of like, you know, 11 million steps of how to do a deadlift and I was just kind of looking at it and like trying to do it on on me and all this kind of stuff down in my basement and uh and I um you know worked that program for a while I had no idea what a linear progression was I had no idea what starting strength was at that point um and I got to the place where I was just deloading and like, if I think like the rule, not the starting strength rule, but this rule was sort of like, if you fail X amount of times on a set, deload X percent and then work back up. So I did that a couple of times and I kept getting back to the point where I'm like, I don't, I don't think I can add weight anymore. Like, I don't know what to do here. What, what was and your I, squat at, at that um, roughly? Gosh, I wish I had my journals. I could tell you, I want to say... I don't know. I could guess like maybe low hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Low, five like, by five is not is not for novices and especially not women novices. So I just was, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure yeah. my uh, that that applied to your situation as well, and it it did. So hundreds is it it totally does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because I had no. I'm like this seems like a guide. I'll just I'll just do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Uh, so I happened to run into somebody at a psychology conference and I was, you know, heard them talking about weightlifting and I was like, Oh, somebody else. Cause like I it was the other thing I want to mention is like, it felt very isolating for me. Like as a middle-aged woman, none of my friends are doing this stuff. I didn't know anyone else. I was too afraid to go to the gym. Like God, you know, I don't want to, that did not feel like an option for me. I was doing all this stuff by myself in the basement. Um, and I didn't see anybody out there like me. You know, I wasn't like, there was some like women power lifters. I'm like, that's cool, but that's also not what I'm doing. You know, like that didn't really match, you know, um, they were young or I didn't really see anybody like me out there. Um, so I heard these people talking and um, the this guy said, I think you should really check out starting strength. Like, um, I think you should, um, you know, I think it's going to be really helpful for you. Just, you know. So I did, um, and I found the website, I got the blue book, I started, um, and, um, you know, I want to say I read every single page of the blue book, but I didn't, I read most of it, <laughs> skipped over some parts. It's dense. Um, it's dense, yeah. but it did help me, um, again, like kind of come back to form and, you know, but again, I wasn't getting any form checks. I was just like guessing what I was doing was right again, which kind of hindered my progression. Um, and I finally, I think, um, there was an article online, I think that Nick had written about, um, like the overhead press and women Mm. or like kind of maybe switching from like fives to threes or I forget what it was, but it was like, Oh, that that's the closest thing I can find to like me, Mm. you know, like I'm having a problem with that. It just felt like a match. And I ended up reaching, I'd been like, I'm just going to, I'll send him an email. I'll just, you know, he's a coach there. It looks like I'll just see what happens. But it was really scary to sort of, to, to make that step. 
you know, and I say that, um, again, because I, I felt like, um, lifting was un, not accessible to somebody like me. Um, you know, I don't look like, um, I don't look like a lifter. I, it felt embarrassing. I'm like, here's this middle-aged woman, like, Hey, can you help me like with my lifts? Like, you know, I, you think of like the, the weightlifting world and it, it didn't, I didn't feel like I had a place there. Um, not yet. So You're the future of the brand though, because I feel like uh, well, I have a lot to say about it. Yeah. yeah, please, please do for sure. Yeah. Um, so I got in touch with Nick. We did like a consult video call. It was amazingly cool. You know, like I feel like I have this like kind of fine tuned bullshit meter, and Nick was like passed with flying colors of like somebody that I could trust. And Isn't that just the was chillest, the most confident guy. Thing. Totally, yeah. totally. Can you say something bad and about him? Because we, we always just compliment him on the show. Can you say, what's the worst thing about Nick? <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah, I got too. nothing. I'll think of something. We'll ask Rip. Rip will have something to say. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I started working. He, he, we sort of did this like consultation. He kind of got me going back on. He's like, let's do some form checks, you know, made some adjustments. Um, and that was sort of my step into like, you know, um, more, um, I don't know, I guess I would say like, it wasn't redoing the linear progression, but I had sort of, that was my beginning really with like starting strength and with really kind of doing a program that that was probably about a year and a half after I'd started on my own that I'd tapped out. And I was like, I, I can't, I can't figure out my own programming. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, but the thing that I really wanted was I wanted to keep doing it. That was the thing that was really motivating me. And I remember saying to Nick, I'm like, you know, I don't care. I, somebody told me I was going to be lifting like over 200 pounds. I'd be like, that's impossible. Double body um, deadlift. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so like, again, that's sort of like, you don't know what you, you don't know what you're capable of. I'm going to outsource all my programming. You know, he's going to do all that stuff for me. I I got the pro practical programming book, but it was, again, it was just something that, um, you know, it, it was a little too overwhelming for me to imagine. Like, I'm like, I don't want to be a, co this feels like something I would, if I were to be a coach, I would kind of consume all of this and be able to do my own programming. Um, but if somebody else could do it for me, let's just do that. Yeah. And it weren't, and it was exactly what I needed. I want to just mention that yeah. it's sort of like your profession, isn't it? You're in the professional services industry. So I could, uh, yeah. I could go learn about psychology, look it up online, buy books and try to treat myself, but this is what you do for a living, you know? So uh, yeah. I'm assuming you're good at what you do. Um, I'm probably better off just asking you for some help instead of trying to educate myself in your domain of expertise. <laughs> Um, so I think that's an efficient way to go for productive adults, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that as a segue because there are so many parallels, you know, between that kind of, um, you know, what I would say too, about, um, having the experience. Uh, and I, when I say experience, I mean like the physical, the actual felt experience of, of lifting, um, as instead of, you know, that translation from just reading about it to actually doing it. Um, and which is why I would say, like, go to a seminar. I didn't go to a seminar because I think I found Nick and that sort of served, served what I was needing at that time. <laughs> um, but to really get the experience um, is a lot different from trying to do it on your own or trying to, um, you know, kind of figure it out. So, yeah. Um, Break down yeah. for us what it was like to start with Nick, because it sounds like you both were interviewing each other. From the question he asked you, I, I get the sense he was interviewing you mm -hmm. too, because Nick doesn't work with everybody. <laughs> so, okay, that's um, nice. Yeah. Um, so, so what was it like once you once you got started? How did that How did that go down? It was it was awesome. You know, I would say I was really in the exact right place that I needed a coach. Um, my kind of criteria was I want somebody that I can trust. And by trust, I mean like somebody that I feel like I know that they know what they're talking about, even if I don't know, <laughs> obviously is why I need a coach. Yeah. Um, but I want the sense that this person knows what they're doing, what they're suggesting to me feels genuine, 
feels like I really believe in what I'm asking you to do. Um, felt really solid. I think that was the thing that, um, you know, even the five by five is, is different, but there weren't like a lot of advertisements on the page. Like I didn't feel like I was being sold a product. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like that here's the, that I was being sold a skill Mm -hmm. or a set of skills, Mm -hmm. um, which is huge. And you don't find that in a lot of places. Um, so I think, uh, that was the sort of the criteria for me that I felt like this person has my best interest in mind of, of whatever that is, you know, meeting my goals or I just want to keep doing this as long as I can. Um, so that was, I mean, th- those are two simple criteria, yeah. but it's very tough to find someone yeah. who not only clearly has your best interests in mind, wants what's best for you, but also has the skills, the background and the experience to provide you with what you're looking mm-hmm. for. I mean, this industry, yeah. that's, uh, when you find a coach like that, you know, keep them yeah. close, right? Yeah, for real, yeah. for real. Um, yeah, because I think, you know, I think about my experience as a female going to a gym and asking to lift like free weights, like plates, barbells. I mean, it's just it, there was zero in my mind, you know, opportunity for that. So shout out to starting strength gyms where if I had seen that, I think like people like me lifting, um, people older than me lifting, people of all different shapes and sizes lifting, um, with that like one-on-one, you know, careful attention. I mean, like I'm all in. Well, we'd love so to put I one think in that, There's just not enough people up there, unfortunately. I know. <laughs> we only have like a million people. Yeah. A I lot mean, of moose and a lot of snow. Yeah. It sounds pleasant, but at the same time, not a, not a good place to, uh, no make a bet on a new yeah. business. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm especially exactly. curious about your first session. Can you can you break down for the people listening and watching um, what it's like on day one with an yeah. online coach? So what you know what what was different from the way you normally lifted? Uh, was it live? Did you record mm-hmm. yourself? How, how did that all go down? So Nick showed me the um, just the coaching software interface um, that he uses, and said I'm gonna you know I'm gonna push you these. Um, I'm going to send you the workouts. It wasn't all too, the structure was roughly the same three times a week. Um, You know, pretty easy to see, like, these are the lists that you're going to do today. Here's a video and just, uh, you know, one of the starting strength, like um, how to press videos, five minutes, if you need to just like refresh your technique. Um, And he said, I want you to record like the, uh, you know, the last set of, um, of like your heaviest, you know, of your, um, uh, the last set of your workout for each of the exercises Mm -hmm. and we'll just do a form check. Um, so I got like a cheapo little, you know, tripod thing and tried to find a right place in my basement for to set it up and, um, uploaded the videos and got feedback right away of like, okay, this looks good. Um, so it was just that, I think we, I don't think we did like an actual online session, Um, I think by that, by that time, maybe it was farther enough along, at least the, you know, the technique stuff that we could talk about together. I think actually we looked at my form together. We watched the clips and just drew some lines, keep this here, you know, make sure your knees aren't over your feet, um, little things that we kind of tweaked together. Mm -hmm. And then it was just kind of, you know, keeping that going. Did you have um, any major technique epiphanies uh, within your first couple of weeks with Nick where you're like, oh, this makes so much more sense or this feels so much better or this yeah. hurts less or anything like that? I don't remember any epiphanies. Um, I think I had way overcomplicated the squat. Um, and so I was just, you know, micromanaging everything. So I think the big epiphany was like just a layoff, you know, like just let your body like really just feel it, yeah. let yourself bounce off the bottom, like just kind of work with it. And that was a huge change for me instead of like making my mechanical body look exactly like the picture, you know, and like thinking about the muscles. So I have a tendency to like overanalyze and kind of micromanage it. And Nick was like, it's fine. Like just if I'm like, did my, was my pinky, you know, like in the right place? And he's like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. So just even having that is right. Like, don't worry about it. So that was a big lesson for me of like, and uh, I want to say like a life lesson of, of like, just don't micromanage shit. Like just, it's fine. Sure. 
And, um, and again, it's nice to have, as you alluded to, it's nice to have the person with the experience there to let you know that you actually don't totally. need to worry about that thing because it's not that important. Yeah. What were the major differences that you noticed programming wise? Uh, less reps. Um, I was trying, I was doing all this five by five stuff. Yeah. And so a lot of variation there of like three by three, you know, six sets of two, uh, singles. Yep. So those like sort of a, you know, a heavy lift and then a back down set of three by threes or something. So I think he could really tailor it to, you know, a small female. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that was a, that's another huge benefit. I think of coaches of like, you know, this wide range of, of people that you might see, you know? Um, so programming for someone like me is certainly going to look a lot different than, you know, a 22 year old, you know, six foot three, 200, whatever pound guy, you sure. know? Yeah. Um, did did so, that, did that just, throw you for a loop at all? Um, because I get the sense you're an overachiever. Um, and, and, uh, I don't, you know, w when I started doing intermediate programming and I moved to sets uh, of sets that were fewer than five, it kind of felt to me like I was doing less and maybe it wouldn't be as effective when in fact that was actually mm. what was necessary to drive the progress up. Did you have a similar mm -hmm. thought or, or was it just like, look, this guy knows what he's doing. I trust him and I'm just going to do what he says. Yeah. That was the second part gotcha. for sure. Cool. So you guys yeah. built a real, like a real bond and some real trust with Nick. I did. Yeah. I really did. I think the other folks that work with him feel the same mm -hmm. of like, um, you're just not, I'm not being sold something. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, um, and somebody that knows what they're doing. That's really what I wanted to be able to just put everything on. Like, I'm not going to have to worry about this. How, how long have you been uh, training with Nick now? Uh, since um, about like September, 2021. So whatever that is, year and yeah. a half. And, so, and what, yeah. are, what are you, um, what's keeping you motivated? Are you still making PRs? Um, did you achieve mm -hmm. your goal? Uh, how are you feeling about lifting now that you're, you're pretty damn strong and, and progress is slower than it was? Things were going swimmingly. I'm like always looking forward to my workouts, something I'd never really had with running. So it just kind of fed itself for a while. The numbers, you know, I really lost interest in numbers. There's like, I got those sticker numbers in the back of my head, but nothing, you know, wasn't forcing a number, which also I think is key of like just letting the, the progression happen, just be consistent. Um, but um I started getting to the, maybe it was like the beginning of this year. I really, I was starting to feel a little bit of a grind. Mm. Um, and I couldn't really put my finger on it. Um, and I didn't tell Nick just yet, but I was like, oh, I don't know. It's just not quite as magical mm. as it was. Mm -hmm. And I maybe I just hoped it went away. Um, and then I kind of tweaked my back a little bit, just a, just like a muscles pull. And, um, had to sort of drop down a little bit in weight on something and um, because, and forced to just, you know, just because of my back. And um, it felt, it was kind of a relief I found to sort of do that lighter weight. Mm. And then in comparison, when I sort of went back to the, to the heavier weight, I, I sort of had this shift in perspective of like, Oh, okay. Like, I can get my mind now around the grind. Mm -hmm. Like it is a grind and, and there's sort of, um, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's sort of put in perspective to me. Like this is, um, it's not a decline. It's not when it starts feeling grindy, it's not that I'm losing anything. It's just, I need to up my resources for dealing with the grind mm -hmm. kind of like out mile, 82 in the middle of the friggin' woods, mm. you know, at night, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I think, um, it helped me sort of get this perspective of, right. Okay. The heavy days are going to be the heavy days. The grindy days are just going to be the grindy days. Mm. And, um, it just, I had to sort of get my head around that. So I feel like, um, you know, I told Nick, it's like the easiest hard thing I've ever done is, is lifting. I'm like, get to, you know, for me, I still really love how my body feels under the bar. I like the resistance. I like the deliberate slowness of it. Mm. Um, I think that's just how, just kind of how I'm wired. 
um, you know, I was telling, uh, trying to tell my running friends, I'm like, you get to sit down for like five minutes all the time. <laughs> I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> and then you do like a really, really, really hard thing. And then you get to sit down and then you get to do a really, really hard thing. And I'm like, this is exactly what I want to do. Like, this is, this is brilliant. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I feel great. I feel a hundred times better than I ever did running. Running just makes you tired and hungry mm. and, you know, you're not building muscle, uh, really. Mm. Um, if you're so, running hundred miles, you're absolutely burning muscle. It's like, the yeah, catabolic yeah, that's activity. a great point. You're chewing up whatever yeah. available resource you have because you've got to, yeah. you've got to fuel the, you know, the, the Survival. propelling your body forward <laughs> requires fuel, right? So. Yeah. Have you done uh, blood work as an ultra marathoner versus now as a lifter? Uh, I don't think there was any huge difference. As you know, as I'm aging, I think there may be that may be like a little bit of a confounding factor. I think my cholesterol was a little bit higher, um, but I also was shifting to eating more meat, more protein, mm. um, more animal stuff. I wasn't a vegetarian or anything, but, um, I actually started, I think I started eating better. Um, it was borderline. I think my cholesterol was kind of borderline Mm -hmm. on the higher side, but nothing. Um, you know, I had some anemia, I think running Mm -hmm. a lot, Mm -hmm. um, that's gone away, but, um, I'd be really curious to see reactive protein, your, your systemic inflammation marker. Um, Mm, I'll have to write that down. Yeah. Yeah. If you, what is uh, it? C reactive protein. Um, if you happen to find it after we talk, feel free to, to email Bree and she can throw it in the show notes or put it up yeah. on the screen. Just uh, if there's anything notable there. Um, I want to ask, so I've got a, a, several follow-ups on the running versus lifting thing. Um, so you feel, you feel less beat up. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what about like your, your mood and your energy? Is there anything else you want to share about how you feel as a runner, as a lifter versus a runner? Yeah. Um, I would say I, I feel more energized. I would say I have more, um, one thing I noticed, you know, earlier on was just like, just kind of feeling, just feeling more solid, Mm. you know, feeling just physically. Um, and, um, the cool thing is now, like I run socially, I'll run like maybe once a week with, with friends. Um, and I'm able to, we're not running super fast, but I'm lifting, helps me maintain, you know, uh, enough strength to sort I can go out and run like five to 10 miles um, in the woods. Again, not super fast, but with, really without a problem. It's no big deal. So I'm able to, I can hike, I can do a lot of stuff um, and still um, not feel like I'm, you know, huffing and puffing. I'm happy to hear you say that because um, a lot of people, up. unfortunately, uh, look at this stuff as, uh, as kind of black and white. It's not black and white. You know, you can run and you yeah. can lift. You can lift and you can run. Um, there's optimal totally. optimal ways you can set these things up to based on what your your goals are, and what you're trying to achieve. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll bet you running is more enjoyable now, isn't it? Because it's not the thing. Absolutely. It's just kind of a hobby that you do on the side with buddies. Yeah. And um, I don't know about you. I, actually, I'd love to hear your feedback on this. But when I so I, I ran as a skinny weak guy, and then I did the starting strength program and was preparing for a fight and uh, had to do some road work for the fight. And running was just a lot easier for me. Like each, each ripido says each step that you take is more submaximal. And I certainly found that to be true. Um, and I felt yeah. like my joints were getting less beat up because, uh, my legs were strong. I had, you know, had mm-hmm. quad definition and, uh, I had, I had totally. more support around my joints. What, what was your experience with that? I would say the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, just feeling steadier, feeling stronger, feeling like a climb, feeling like I just felt stronger overall. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and noticeable, you know, I think that was again, sort of part of what I wanted in, um, you know, from lifting also all the benefits mm-hmm. of, of just like feeling stronger, which I, I never had a sense of what it felt like to be strong ever in my life before. So obviously, cause I'm not really, wasn't strength training or, or doing something that would demand my strength. Running is just pounding, you know, it wasn't like doing handstands or push ups or anything like that. But, um, so it feels really, and I think this is definitely something for women. Um, a, a lot of women who are working on trying to get their bodies smaller, which I certainly, you know, was 
a victim of that, um, to be in a bigger body, to be in a more muscular body, to be in a stronger body, um, is, um, it can be counterintuitive, but like, so amazing when you're like, Oh wait, this is, this is all good. Like, I don't mind taking up more space now. Well, not only Um, that, but, but that, um, that little mind bug is so prevalent that, uh, I'll have middle-aged gals in the gym who are gaining weight, but their waists are getting smaller and their butts are getting bigger and they're still worried about the mm-hmm. weight gain. And I'm like, hold on a sec here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Everything is going past, in the right yeah. direction. Yeah, you're getting stronger and you, you're happy with how you look and there's just some arbitrary number on the scale. Muscle's heavy, right? It's heavier than fat. Yeah. Um, what What was your... Uh, What's your opinion on aesthetics? Um, it, so, so I totally understand your message that you know you feel better. You're in a, a, a bigger body, a stronger body, more capable body. Um, from a purely functional, logical perspective, that makes perfect sense. But we all know, um, you know, you being a psychologist, especially um, the emotional side is critically important, and and body image, especially mm-hmm. for for women, is uh, is a huge part of identity. Um, what? How do you feel about your aesthetics as a as a lifter versus a runner? Yeah. I mean, I think this is the body, like, like maybe I was um, mentioning before, like, this is the body I thought I would get from running a lot oh, with just like larger muscles, more definition. Um, but it, it has, you know, I find some old snags. Sure. When I'm like, and this is one thing like we kind of tease Nick about of like, we have to buy new clothes now. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, none of the women can like find shirts that fit because, you know, <laughs> they're not made for muscular women. Yeah. Um, but um, so it, it's a little bit of an, adju- it was a little bit of an adjustment of just kind of like being in a, in a larger body when everything, not everything, but like w- when, maybe your learning history is we're all trying to be in smaller bodies or smaller bodies are more attractive or, or whatever. So, um, knowing that I'm strong, like it's, it's like this because I'm strong. It's not like this because I'm not healthy. Um, it it is a mindset for me. We like capable women over here starting um, strength, you know? Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) There's a, there's, there is no virtue in being dainty and fragile as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Yeah. uh, And I never really had that body anyway, as like a a five foot, I was never like a ballerina. So it was sort of like, you know, was waiting for it, (laughs) waiting for the weights. Well, well, Mindy, I know, I know you have, um, I know you have some thoughts you alluded to earlier about lifting for women and potentially women in their middle age in particular. So, um, please share whatever you think is worth mentioning about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, um, I think one thing that's really helpful is seeing other people like you, um, kind of doing it. Um, that's one thing I think it, for me, like sort of it feeling in isolation of like being afraid to sort of reach out to Nick. Cause I'm like, what's he going to want to do with like this middle-aged lady? Um, I'm not a client. Uh, so not even seeing myself in that role. Um, but So some of it, I think, is just like, yeah, there are there's lots of different kinds of people out there lifting for one. Um, And the other thing I would say is like, try the experience, see if you like it, you know, have the actual experience of going to a seminar or at least, you know, going to a starting strength gym and, and working out with somebody just to see what it feels like under the bar. Is that something that that your body wants to do? Um, with some, again, with somebody that you can trust, you know, someone that's here not to, you know, um, sell you a program or be, you know, having like 50 other clients while you're standing there, like with a barbell by yourself. So, uh, I think the one-on-one attention, um, I would say like, go have the experience, see if you like it, um, that it's available to you, um. Give us the Mindy those, Slavinsky, those are things uh, bullshit meter recommendation. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's something like, uh, when you talk to the person, <laughs> try to, try to validate whether or not they're mostly interested in something that's selfish for them, or if I can tell that they're actually interested in what benefits me. That's mm. kind of how I look at things. What's your, how do you approach when, yeah. you're, when you're sussing somebody out for the first time? Yeah, I think, um, 
I think there's sort of an air, like sort of a sense of confidence in the person, mm. you know, like I felt like Nick knew what he was talking about, but he also didn't need to tell me that he knew what he was talking about. You could just tell like sort of matter of fact, this is how we, you know, this is just how it is. So I think that sort of trust piece along with sort of like a, a quiet confidence piece <laughs> um, and somebody who's just willing to meet you where you are. Mm. You know, I think that's huge that you can get from that sense of a coach um, of, of somebody who's uh, not like, let me show you how it's done. Like getting under the bar and like, <gasps> you know, mm. like doing a bunch of bench press, just like, Hey, let me, I see where you are. Um, you know, somebody that can really join you in wherever it is that you are. If it's like, I'm afraid to even like get under the bar of like, okay, here's how I want you to hold it. You know, here's what you can expect. Here's how I want you to put your feet, just see what happens. Like kind of to walk, like a matter of fact, you know, helpful walk through, I would imagine, you know, of like, um, just something that would get you willing to try. Yep. Um, and again, some it's, I think for some people they're like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I just don't think that's for me. Awesome. I think for me, I was so kind of surprised and happy to be like, Oh, this is exactly what I want to do. Like it was a relief, Hell you know, yeah. like I could like, let go of the running, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, by the time this episode comes out, which will be probably a month and a half or two months, um, I believe we'll have our new website up and our new, uh, franchise wide offer, which is anyone can come in for a free 30 minute coaching session. So Nice. Come in, see a coach, do a lift, see if it's for you. If anybody's pushing yeah. at all and trying to get you to sign up mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that doesn't make you feel comfortable, please let me know. And uh, that will be resolved. <laughs> That's not how we do business. Um, yeah. And then if you're like Mindy and you live out uh, away from people in a nice, peaceful area um, <laughs> and you don't have access to a gym, you can uh, you can get coaching from one of our coaches at, 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 our, at any of our gyms if you go to onlinecoaching.startingstrengthgyms.com. Um, Mindy, what can we do better? Is there anything that, that should be improved about, mm -hmm. about, uh, I know that the community aspect's tough. You're kind of just lifting alone. Do you have any ideas on what we can do to, to improve things? Or are you pretty happy with the way they are? I'd say I'm pretty happy with how things are, you know, Nick has his clients on, um, like sort of a Slack channel and that's really helpful just to sort of like, you know, it's super supportive. Uh, we can like make fun of each other in a good way but also like there's all kinds of cheers for a pr even if it's just like one pound or something like that so that that that's my substitute for sort of being able to go to a gym and, and see people um and it's a whole wide range and there's you know so it's it's um feels like a like a fun community yeah. so that, that part's really great yeah um, i know a few of nick's clients he's got a good group um yeah is there anything that you wanted to mention that i haven't asked you about Hmm. I don't think so. I mean, I think we covered a lot of stuff. Um, I would hope that if there's people out there that might come across this podcast that are thinking about lifting and are like in their late forties, female, little athletic background, and they're curious that they, that there's something in what I said that, that might sound like it might be okay to check it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, when it comes to preventing, um, wasting of muscle mass of losing bone density of all of the nasty stuff that comes along with that, 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 uh, aging women are especially susceptible to balance issues and falling down and breaking hips and all this nonsense. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be that way. It does not have to be that way. You can yeah. be a double body weight, uh, deadlifter, just like Mindy and, uh, you can have, you can have, uh, you know, you can, you can be, um, forged from steel as much as you can be by, by just, you know, continually refining your, your, uh, your physical capability under the bar. And then, um, and then all the psychological benefits that come along with that. Um, and actually Mindy, I want, I wanted to end there. So are you, are you taking on remote clients in your practice by chance? I know, I know several people that are looking for a good psychotherapist at the moment because there's the demand is high and the supply yeah. is low. So I'm just curious if you take people. Yeah. Remote. Um, there's a couple of caveats. I, I could, I can't with my license. Um, we can't see people outside of Maine for psychotherapy, but there is like a version of like kind of coaching, um, that would just be slightly different that would allow for out of state clients, um, to, you know, they can reach me at my email. Um, 
and right and reach out and and work it that way. So you so want, I couldn't you do. Sure, it's it's my name Mindy Slavinsky at gmail dot com. Cool. Okay. And um, if you want to ask about like remote coaching, um, would sort of fall fall under that umbrella. Gotcha. Excellent. Okay, good. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap there. Um, Mindy, I'm glad you came on mm-hmm. the show. I think uh, more people need to understand the benefits of this in uh, specific mm-hmm. to your demographic. Um, so we just told the story yeah. for about an hour here and uh, and you're contrasting it with with uh, with your experience as an ultra marathoner and it's um, you've done the other stuff and, and you're doing this and this is what suits you at this stage of your life and the benefits speak for themselves. So yeah. um, so lastly, where, do, you, do you share anything online? Do you have a social media account where people can follow your you lifting and things or are you a little private with that stuff? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Um, I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if, uh, if you don't mind though, please send us some videos so we can stitch them into this uh, podcast episode. Sure. Um, and if you do awesome. have, if you do have a PR that you're proud of that you think would inspire other women, please share that with Nick and then we can put that up on uh, the social media accounts and, and help spread the word. Awesome. Well, for thanks sure. for your time today, Mindy. It was nice talking to you. Thanks. You too. All right. I'll let you know when this thing goes live. Give us a couple of months. Okay. Right. Sounds good, Ray. Thanks. Talk soon. Awesome. All right. Bye. Bye.